Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the first event of the 2019 Humanities Forum. My name is Alex Moffat and I'm the director of the Development of Western Civilization program. And really I'm a substitute today for Raymond Hain, the director of the Humanities Forum, who's taking a well-deserved sabbatical. I would like to thank the Office of College Events for helping to arrange today's talk and also to thank you for coming. And I'd also like to encourage you to come to future uh, Humanities Forum events, which take place most Fridays. Next Friday, we'll be holding, uh, hosting excuse me, Susan Ashbrook Harvey, who has a talk entitled Voices of the Liturgy, Models from Ancient Syriac Christianity. Later in the semester, we'll have a series of events on Alexander Solzhenitsyn, including a talk by Pulitzer Prize-winning author Anne Applebaum, and that's on March 22nd, so mark calendars. And we'll be concluding the semester with a talk by Namwali Serpel, winner of the 2015 Kane Prize for African Fiction, and that's on April 26th. And so I encourage you to check out the Humanities Forum page, uh, and it's on the College of Arts and Sciences uh, website. Now I'd like to present my colleague, Dr. Patrick Breen, who will be introducing today's speaker. Dr. Breen. Thank you for coming out. Nicole Hannah Jones is a domestic correspondent from the New York Times Magazine, where she has been since 2015. Her writing focuses on civil rights, especially the topics of race and education, and she's been working on the topic since she joined her high school newspaper and began reporting on students like her who were taking part in a voluntary busing program in Waterloo, Iowa. Nicole Hannah-Jones attended a certain well-known Catholic college in South Bend, Indiana, like Voldemort, I don't think we'll say the name, um, where she received a BA in history and African American studies. She later went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she received an MA from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. She has written for the Raleigh News and Observer, Portland's or or Oregonian, and ProPublica. In 2013, she won a Sydney Award. Two, two years later, she was the Journalist of the Year from the National Association of Black Journalists. In 2016, she, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones co-founded the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting, a training and mentorship program de dedicated to increasing the ranks of investigative reporters of color. In October of 2017, she was named a MacArthur Fellow more commonly known as a genius grant. Her first book, The Problem We All Live With, is scheduled to come out in 2020 and will explore black America, uh, America's century-long struggle uh, to have black students receive an equal education and why integrated schools are the linchpin of our democracy. This is actually connected to how I've come across um, Nicole Hannah-Jones in my teaching. I teach a, a DWC seminar on Tocqueville and Democracy in America with Raymond Hain. And uh, the first half of the colloquium, we read Democracy in America, where Alexis de Tocqueville talks about all the issues involved in democracy in 1830. And then in the second half of the semester, the students go out and find long form articles where the issues today are brought up. And our students, every time we run this class, come up with um, Nicole Hannah-Jones articles, which are great, great sources of discussion. Today, Nicole Hannah-Jones will speak on choosing a school for her daughter in New York, a segregated city. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Hannah-Jones to Providence College. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all here. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's always a little weird <laughs> to have someone reading off uh, whatever. Uh, so I appreciate you all coming out. Uh, my speech is entitled The Problem We All Live With, which uh, I got that name from a famous Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges as she was becoming the first black child um, in the South to attend a white elementary school. And I just 
feel like it's an apt um, title both for my talk and for my book because the issue of school segregation and racial inequality is an ongoing struggle and it is a struggle that is almost as old as our nation itself. So some of you may have read my work or heard uh, my work on the radio. Many of you may not have, so I'm just gonna let you know in advance. Uh, this talk is going to uh, include a lot of history as my works do, and I'm gonna talk a lot because my pieces are all very long and I tend to be very wordy. Uh, the speech is also not going to be uplifting. Um, I know this is part of your Martin Luther King uh, Forum for the Week, um, but we should all keep in mind Martin Luther King was assassinated, and so you know it's not actually an uplifting story. And his dream, uh, I don't think, has come true. So we're going to talk about this long um, struggle to bring democracy to all of America. And so we're gonna go from the past into the present time, and I'm gonna be talking specifically about schools because, uh, as was mentioned, I do believe that uh, education and integrated schools are the linchpin of our democracy, and as long as we continue to maintain a system of segregated and unequal schools, then we are continuing to deny full democracy to our citizens. So I'm just gonna begin as I begin all my talks by just showing a couple photos so we can get centered in exactly what it is and who it is that we're talking about. Because we tend to think about racial inequality as an abstraction, but racial inequality affects real people. And particularly when we're talking about schools, it affects children, it affects American children. So these are some photos of some of the children whom I've met in my years of reporting on school segregation who have attended um, entirely segregated schools all across the country. And this young lady here, uh, we're gonna come back to her in the end. So if we begin with understanding the role of public education in this country, the struggle for public education was a struggle um, to provide a comp system of commonly funded schools in the belief that common schools that a free public education that mixes the masses is the equalizer of conditions of men. And it's probably one of the most closely held American beliefs, that we could be a classless society and that schools would be the avenue for that, that it didn't matter where you were born, what type of parents you were born into, whether you were immigrant or whether you were native born American, that you could come into uh, the walls of a classroom and learn together for the common good. Of course, if this were actually true, I wouldn't be giving a speech before you today. And I think what's actually far closer to the truth is the fact that from the founding of common schools in this country, we've always had two philosophies of education. Uh, as Professor James Anderson says, one for democracy, which was the education we have largely reserved for white children and the children who would be made white, and one for oppression, which is the education that has uh, been reserved for black children and increasingly Latino children, and sometimes Asian American children, depending on how they come to the United States. So to understand this, I always find it useful to go back in time, all the way back to uh, the beginning of what would become the United States. And I offer this timeline because, as we know, Americans, we are pretty shitty at understanding history, and when it comes to the history of race in this country, we have downright amnesia. We either don't learn the true history, or we forget it, or we downplay it. And I think if we want to understand the centrality of racial inequality, then we need to actually understand the centrality of racial inequality from our very beginnings. If we understand that in 1607, the English landed Jamestown, and it takes us but 12 years to import Africans to be enslaved, to import Africans and to say that they will be a class of people set aside from all other human beings, that they will be treated as property, they will not be treated as human beings, and they will not have the ability to be citizens even in the land of their own birth. You understand that it takes just 12 years before we even are considering becoming a country at all, and we have already introduced racial caste into this land, then it should not be surprising that somehow we still struggle. We consider it took another 150 years after the first Africans land in Virginia. And if you do the math, you realize that this year is the 400th anniversary of this decision, 400 years in a country that is not 400 years old. In 1776, it takes 150 years before we decide we want to be a nation of our own. And in the Declaration of Independence, how many of you guys have ever read the entire Declaration of Independence? 
Who would like to recite it? Just kidding. Okay. If you've read the Declaration of Independence, or if you have not, you have an understanding of what the Declaration did. You understand that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. But what many people don't know is the Declaration that we know was not the original draft. And in the original draft of the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson actually talks about the institution of slavery. And he castigates the King of England for introducing slavery into the colonies because he clearly understands the blatant hypocrisy of a new country that is saying it is going to be the most free, uh, liberatory and free democracy in the history of the world while at the same time holding one fifth of its population in permanent human bondage known as chattel slavery. That one cannot claim both of these things. So he puts language into the original declaration that calls out that hypocrisy but the reason it doesn't make it into the declaration that you can go visit in Philadelphia right now is because he could not get enough signers to the declaration if he included the passage about slavery. And at that point, we make the decision that we will enter into this world a new country that will be a slaveocracy. And that Thomas Jefferson himself, who owned human beings, hundreds of human beings, will continue to own those hundreds of human beings until the day he died, including owning his own children. It would take us, of course, nearly another 100 years before we would end the institution of slavery, and it would take the deadliest war in the history of our country in order to do that. Now, I hope there are no one in here who doesn't know what the Civil War was fought about, but it was not states' rights, unless it was the states' rights to own slaves. The Civil War was fought over the institution of slavery and the expansion of slavery to the West, and we have to fight a war that nearly cleaves our country in half to end this institution. It would take another 100 years until the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968 before black Americans have full and equal legal citizenship rights in the country of their birth, in the country of their grandparents' birth, in the country of their great-grandparents' birth. Immigrants whose um, parents came here 10 years before automatically would have more rights than black Americans whose families had gone back for generations until the year of 1968. So, 1976, who knows what happened that year? This is probably what most scholars would consider uh, the most important event in American history, which is I was born. But you're a historian, so you know, maybe, maybe you don't agree. It's okay, it's my speech. <laughs> you see where I got the affinity for big hair? Uh, so I was born in 1976, and I bring that up because I think it is important to understand that merely eight years before I was born, it was perfectly legal to deny someone like myself housing, the ability to rent or buy into certain neighborhoods simply because I have African ancestry. Eight years before I was born. Nine years before I was born, it was illegal for me to exist in several states in the country because my mother is white and my father is black and it was illegal for black and white people to marry until the Supreme Court ruled on this in 1967. If you go back 11 years before I was born, it was perfectly legal to deny black people the right to vote in certain parts of the United States. And if you go back 12 years before I was born, it was perfectly legal to deny black people the right to go to a public library, even though their tax dollars pay for that library. To go to a public pool, even though their tax dollars pay for that public pool. To go to restaurants, to go to hotels, to use certain bathrooms. This is not ancient history. And so, though I don't necessarily like to age myself, I think it's important to understand that I'm clearly not an old woman, but all of these things were legal right before I was born. And my father was born into Jim Crow, Mississippi, and did not have the legal right to vote in Mississippi until well into his years as a grown man. So this is not far in the past. Even though we often see images of the civil rights movement and they're in black and white, so we like to pretend that this was a very long time ago. And then we like to say, well, why do black people still complain? Why do we still have inequality? You guys got your rights. But when you consider the timeline, 360 years of racial apartheid, 50 years 
of legal citizenship, but with no reparations made for that first 350 years, and also understanding we had to go through a very deadly and brutal and violent civil rights movement in order to get those rights, then we should not be surprised at all. What would be shocking is if we had actually solved the issue of racism, because racism is embedded in our country. And it doesn't mean that every white person in here is personally responsible, but what it means is this is your legacy and this is your inheritance. And whether you do anything or not, you benefit from this legacy. So when I think about anything that has to do with racial inequality, I think it is necessary to go back to slavery because slavery formed so much of the inequality that we see today. As I've been researching my book about um, the enduring struggle for black Americans to achieve an education in this country, I went back and I looked at the slave narratives. And it was fascinating to me that this sentiment was something that came up again and again in the interviews of formerly enslaved people. So these were people who had been brutalized, who had been whipped, who had been beaten, who had been maimed, who had been stolen, who had been sold away from their family members, who had been sexually assaulted. But the thing that they could not forgive was being robbed of the ability to read and to get an education. Because black Americans, are the only group of people in the history of this country for whom it was illegal to read. Yet, they still fought to do so anyway. So we think about this pervasive myth, this myth that all of you have heard, and maybe some of you believe, that somehow black people are the only people in America who don't value an education. But that simply is not borne out by historical record. That you had people who during slavery where it was illegal to read, where you could have your fingers removed, where you could have a hand cut off, uh, where you could have an eye gouged out if you were caught reading, they were doing it anyway. They were finding ways to read even though it was illegal. Because black people have always understood that education was never just about could you get a good job. For black Americans, education meant would you be free? That it was impossible to be liberated in a country if you could not read. The reason why the masters did not want black people to read is the understanding that one, once you start to read and think, you challenge your circumstance. Enslaved people became more difficult to control when they were able to read, when they were able to read the Bible and the passages in the Bible where the Israelites leave Egypt, where they're able to read the abolitionist papers that are coming down from the north and finding out that other black people were fighting to free them. So it was very important to control the information that enslaved people had in order to control the behavior that enslaved people have. When you understand that, then it's not surprising that once black people began to begin, get educated, the method of social control then became ensuring that the education they received would be inferior. At first, black people were denied the ability to enter these common schools. So when we talk about Horace Mann and his vision that schools would be the great equalizer, what we're often not told is that he made a compromise. In order to get common schooling, he compromised the education of black children. And black children were originally left out of those common schools, even as the children of immigrants, Irish children, Italian children, were being embraced and brought into these commonly funded schools, black children were denied entry into those schools. Once black people were allowed into those schools, it was ensured that they would be taught an education that would teach them to stay in their place, how to serve, how to be laborers. Black people were not provided often high schools at all. They were not provided college preparatory curriculum. That's how you understand that the inequality that we see today was built into the system of public schools. That the inequality we see today was because we use schools as a form of social control when it came to black people. When it came to white Americans, schools were to be liberatory. Schools were not intended to be liberatory for black Americans. And so until 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that it was completely legal to provide segregated education for black children, as long as that education was equal. But of course, we all know the history of Brown v. Board, which showed that segregated schools were never equal in this country. Somebody doesn't like, like what I'm giving in my speech right now? I'm gonna unplug while I pull this up. I don't need you guys seeing everything on my desktop. <laughs> I 
It's reporting the error to Microsoft right now. Don't get worried. It's going to be okay. I give a lot of these talks. I'm used to things going wrong. I think we're back in business. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. So in 1954, the Supreme Court rules in Brown v. Board of Education. Brown v. Board is considered probably the most important ruling of the 20th century because overnight, and I think most of us probably don't understand how radical this ruling was. The Supreme Court had for more than 60 years sanctioned racial segregation. It had sanctioned uh, racial apartheid as being legal under the Constitution. And so an entire society had structured with this understanding that it was perfectly fine to separate black people in separate facilities in every aspect of American life. And overnight, nine justices on the Supreme Court says that that can no longer stand, that the Constitution does not abide racial segregation. And though all of us in this room, I would imagine, have not known in America where that was not true, that was extremely radical. The way we tend to tell the story is uh, the court rules, and then white America says, you know, we were wrong for all these years. We totally get what you're saying now. We're going to sing Kumbaya, and we're going to go off in an equitable future together. And any segregation that's left is just because black people are poor, they choose it. That's, that's the way that we tend to tell the story. Of course, that's not actually the way that the story goes. This ruling was radical. The South rebels. The South says this is an illegitimate court. Southern congressmen signed the uh, Southern Manifesto, which says this is not a legitimate court and we do not have to comply with the ruling of Brown. And they refuse. White Northerners, on the other hand, applaud the ruling because in white Northerners' mind, the ruling has nothing to do with them whatsoever because, of course, everyone knows there are no racism in the North. So the South launches massive resistance. And a full decade later, there's almost no desegregation, despite the Supreme Court ruling that segregation is illegal and unconstitutional, and that black children have the right to attend integrated schools. And then something happens in 1964, a few things. Finally, the court gets tired of the resistance after a full decade. Now keep in mind, we think about these things in legal abstractions. There are millions of black children who suddenly have rights in 1954, and a decade later, most of those children are no longer in schools anymore, and they have not for a minute, for a second, gotten to live out the rights that they were guaranteed by the Constitution and by the courts. They continued in their segregated and unequal schools. In 1964, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act. We all know that the Civil Rights Act is the Public Accommodations Act that says you can no longer discriminate against people in public accommodations. But what we don't know is that it also dealt with school segregation. And it gave the Justice Department the right to finally start suing school districts that were not complying with Brown. And so for the first time, you had the power of the federal government in enforcing Brown. Uh, at that same time, the federal government also vastly increases the amount of money that is going to school districts uh, by the feds. And so between the carrot and the stick, you were going to be sued if you didn't comply with Brown, and you were going to lose money between those two things, you really saw the dominoes fall very, very quickly in the South. The court got serious. It started to say it wasn't enough to simply erase the law on the books that said schools could be segregated without actually integrating students, but that schools actually had to move students around and move teachers around. And so within four years, you see the dominoes fall. And uh, within less than a decade, majority of black children in the South are now attending integrated schools. 
Why does that history matter? Because what it tells you is when we got serious about desegregating and forcing segregate integration the same way we had forced segregation, it actually worked. So I'm going to take you through a couple of slides, and I want you to just take them in. This first picture here is Ruby Bridges. As you see, she's wearing these very cute um, bobby socks and carrying this very grown attache case. And these nice white men who are flanking her are the US Marshals who had to stand with her and walk her through the angry white mob every day as this child, who at the time was just five years old, attempts to become the first white child or black child to attend a white elementary school in the South. She required US Marshals and armed guard because white parents were so afraid of the single black child ending a school that, by the way, her parents' tax dollars were also paying for. This picture here, these lovely mothers, I want you also to focus on almost all of these pictures. They are women and not men who are protesting these children coming into these schools. These mothers are carrying a casket that they have built and put a brown baby doll in that casket to send a message. They would march this around as Ruby Bridges was attempting to enter the school to send a message to this five-year-old child that this is what would happen to her if they were able to get their hands on her. Now I have a child who's eight and I always think about my child when I look at this picture. And I think about what I have been brave enough as a parent to subject my baby to that in order to make a better world and force our country to live up to his democratic promises. That first semester of school, Ruby Bridges was in her classroom alone because every single white parent pulled their child out of the classroom. And it was just her and her teacher, a white woman who refused to bow to the pressure and not teach this baby. And I think about how isolating and sad that would have been for a child to have to walk through a mob every day only to go into a classroom and sit by herself simply so that she could partake in the education that we have promised all children. Ruby Bridges, by the way, was in New Orleans. So New Orleans was the, the place of the first um, integrated elementary school in the South. This is Boston. Because I know, you know, we up north like to look down at the south as if they're the ones who have the problem with race. The Supreme Court also ruled that the north had to comply with Brown and that even though the north didn't write racial apartheid into its laws largely, uh, the way that the north accomplished segregation was through policy and through housing. So housing in the north was much more segregated. You don't have to write laws to keep black kids out of your schools and your pools and your restaurants if you just keep all black people from moving into your neighborhood. But also what they found in places like Boston and New York and Chicago and Philadelphia, all of these cities, Detroit, were all placed under school desegregation orders because they found that what school boards did was they gerrymandered attendance zones so they would draw maps that look just as crazy as congressional maps in order to keep schools all black or all white. They build schools only in black neighborhoods or white neighborhoods. They would allow all the white kids to transfer out of a school if it started to become a transitioning school. And so the courts found that the North actually was also implementing illegal and unconstitutional segregation and ruled that busing was going to be needed to accomplish integration because housing was so segregated. And white people acted in the North just like they did in the South. They violently resisted desegregation of their schools. These are white mothers in the North who were protesting very small desegregation efforts. We've all heard about busing. What most people don't want to discuss though is one, children have been riding buses for as long as there have been school buses. As long as there have been buses, children have ridden buses. Busing never became a problem until it was used for integration. And even today, tons of kids ride buses, just not for integration. People also forget or they don't know that Linda Brown, who was the lead plaintiff in Brown v. Board of Education, actually sued because she was forced to go to a school that was not her neighborhood school. She was forced to pass the white schools that were in her neighborhood in order to go to a black school, which was much, much further away. So there was no problem with only wanting neighborhood schools or not wanting busing until it became a tool for integration. So as they would say back then, it's not the bus, it's us. 
there's always been this sense that equality for black people was somehow taking away something from white people. These are mothers bringing their children out to protest black kids trying to enter a school. These, of course, are some of the famous pictures of um, National Guardsmen having to be called out in order to ensure the safety of black kids in Little Rock, Arkansas, who are attempting to uh, integrate Central High School. Of course, if you go to Central High School now, it's completely black because all of the white children were simply pulled out of the school. All of these kids, there was usually only a handful of black kids who were being tasked with entering these schools, and they were also very carefully picked to ensure that they had, quote unquote, the highest moral character. Yet even so, these kids were taunted, they were abused, and they were prevented from entering these schools. This picture is also in the north. This is in Syracuse. If we look at these pictures, these are all approximately 1960s. These are your grandparents. These are some of the people in this room. Where did those people go? Did they have a transformation? Or did they pass on that same hatred and animus to their children who perhaps have passed it on to you? So we see when forced by the courts, the South becomes completely transformed. Most of us tend to think of the South as the most segregated. The South has not been the most segregated region of the country for 50 years. Who'd like to guess what's the most segregated region of the country? The Northeast and the Midwest. Find your industrial city that black people migrated to during the Great Migration from the South, and you will find your most segregated cities in the country. Because the North could afford to pretend to be racially egalitarian as long as there were no black people up here. And as soon as black people moved to the North, white people in the North began to react the same way the Southerners did. And in fact, during the segregation of the South, white Southerners would laugh at the North and they'd say, you watch. Once they start coming there, you're going to act just like us. And that's exactly what happened. The thing is that desegregation actually works. I don't know how clear this photo is, but these are third grade reading scores on national assessments. What you'll see is there was a 40 point gap between white and black reading scores in the early 1970s, which is when we first began to do these national assessments. And within only 15 years of real desegregation, we saw that achievement gap cut in half. It actually produced what all of these other reforms that we've implemented have said that they will do, but have not done on scale. And then something happens in 1988. If you look at the test scores, we see that that gap starts to widen in 1988. 1988 is when we start to see the reversal of desegregation. It lines up perfectly. For a variety of reasons, there's a white backlash. As school desegregation starts moving to the north, the white liberal congressmen who supported civil rights as long as it was penalizing the south and making the south behave suddenly began to balk once it became a part of uh, the north. Joe Biden, for instance, a lot of people don't know that he opposed uh, busing for integration and that he helped uh, tuck into the 1964 Civil Rights Act, a provision that made it very difficult to desegregate schools in the North unless you had a court order. Reagan began to close out school desegregation orders and there was a general backlash because if there's one thing that's consistent about our country is we have very little tolerance for racial progress. We will have fits and starts of black people and other uh, communities of color pushing very hard for progress and there will be breakthroughs, and then we will find an immediate retrenchment. And if you need a you know, more contemporary example, just look at what happened after the election of the first black president. Uh, if you look at this graph, what we see is that despite rapid desegregation, desegregation peaks in 1988, and even though black children have never been more than a Approximately 18% was the highest, and typically black folks have never been more than 15% of the population of the United States. There's never been a single point in time where even half of black kids have attended a majority white school in a majority white country. What that tells you is that this is intentional, and that 
there's always been an understanding that you cannot deprive black children of a quality education if they're sitting in the classrooms with white kids. Because then, in order to deprive them, you have to deprive your own children. So in the North, we actually saw very little desegregation. The first test of whether Brown could be applied to the North that goes before the Supreme Court occurs in 1974 in Detroit. By this time, we no longer have the liberal Warren Court, we have the Nixon Court. And Nixon appoints four conservative justices who rule against um, a metro-wide desegregation plan in the North and makes it pretty much impossible to desegregate Northern schools. And so since that time, Northern schools have remained deeply segregated. And your great state of Rhode Island doesn't look good. In fact, you can look at any one of your blue states and the segregation for black children is amongst the worst. New York State, most segregated state in the country for black kids. New Jersey, second most segregated state in the country for black kids. California, most segregated state for Latino kids. These are democratic states. Right here in Providence, we can see, if you look at this graphic, what the uh, racial makeup of the Providence School District is. Anybody who's interested in looking up racial disparities in your own school districts, ProPublica has a great app. It's called uh, Miseducation. And you can put in your school district, and they will give you all types of different data on uh, racial disparities in discipline, achievement, uh, teachers, everything. What this shows is that if you are a white student in the Providence District, even though you are in a minority, you are still much more likely to get access to the best curriculum, the best courses, and far less likely to be disciplined um, and spending time outside of the school. But of course, most of the segregation in this area, as in most places in the North, is between school districts and not within. White people in the North were able to simply move five miles across an invisible municipal line into an all-white community, and you could have your majority white schools without having to worry about appearing to be racist because you just weren't in an area that had any black kids. So you have Providence, which is a heavily black and Latino district, and it's surrounded by school districts that are heavily white. So being that we're out of college, how many of you guys have ever read the Brown v. Board of Education ruling? That's more than I usually get. I don't believe some of y'all, but OK, we're going to go with it. <laughs> it's actually not that common for most people to have read any uh, Supreme Court ruling. And before I started writing about school segregation, I'd never read the Brown v. Board of Education ruling either. But it matters for a reason. And it matters because since most of us have never read the ruling, we actually don't know what the ruling requires. Now, you should feel a little bad because this probably is the greatest Supreme Court ruling in the history of our country, at least top three. But we tend to think of Brown being about separate and unequal. That Brown addresses the unequal conditions in schools for black children. And so that Brown requires equality of resources. But Brown doesn't actually deal with that really at all. Brown is about citizenship. Because see, the South had started to understand that the vast disparity between black and white schools was going to bite them in the ass. They were starting to lose federal lawsuits about the unequal conditions of black schools. So southern states had began pumping a lot of money into black schools in a quick attempt to try to equalize those schools to avoid a larger ruling on school desegregation. What Brown says is that if all of the tangibles and intangibles are the same, if black kids have the same textbooks, same facilities, same teachers, is segregation still unconstitutional? And it says, we believe that it is. Because in a country built on racial caste, that segregation is designed to demean black students. And it is, deni it is designed to deny full democracy to black people. And so therefore, segregation is inherently unequal. It cannot be made equal. When you understand that, then you realize that all of these other reforms we've had that basically are just trying to make segregated schools equal are not actually complying with the spirit of Brown. And we can look at these pictures, the picture on your left, that's Linda Brown sitting in this first seat here, the lead plaintiff in Brown v. Board of Education before they won 
the lawsuit. And we all know that that picture is wrong. But somehow we look at this picture on the right and we're okay with that. Because we say the law no longer requires it. Even though these children and their families are not choosing the segregation. And this is a national scourge. The picture there on the left is in the Bronx. And the picture on the right is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I could add more slides that show schools that are 100% Latino and poor. And often, black and Latino kids are now segregated in schools together. And they are segregated in the lowest resource schools and the highest poverty schools. So when the Supreme Court rules that separate is inherently unequal, what it is recognizing is that when you have a country that has to so demean a race of people that you can trade them and barter them like real estate, that separating those children in their own schools means you will never treat those children like your own, that you will never ensure equality in those schools, and that also you are separating those children from those who have the power in our society. Who runs our institutions? Who runs our government? Who runs this college? Who's in the DA's office or the mayor's office? So when you're separating black and brown children in their own schools, you're not just separating them from access to an equal education, you're also separating them from power. And simply giving those kids a quality teacher doesn't change that, but we don't even give those kids a quality teacher. Because the research on this is very clear. Segregated schools actually exacerbate inequality. Instead of working to close the gap, the longer a black child stays in a segregated school, the further he or she falls behind. If they enter schools three years behind, by the time they graduate, they're six. These schools are not helping our kids reach equality. They're actually ensuring that many of our kids will not. And it's not hard to figure out why. If you go to the US Department of Education, they have a civil rights data collection and what you will find is you plug in any city in the country, and if there's a black school and a white school, that black school always has less. I give dozens of speeches every year. In every community I go in, I challenge anyone to show me the one community where this is not true, where you can go to the black school and it has the same things, and no one has proved me wrong. I'm dying for someone to prove me wrong, because I want to study the hell out of this place that has managed to do what no other place has done. We can, to this day, predict the quality of, it, of education children will receive by the color of the skin of the kids in that school. Everything from access to advanced placement classes to whether they have experience in certified teachers, whether their facilities are up to date, whether they have access to technology, that has not changed. That is the design of the system. So I think I always say this during my speeches. I always hate that I have to say this during my speeches. There's nothing about white kids that makes black kids smart. Y'all don't rub off smart dust on black kids. What having black kids in the same classroom with white kids does is ensure the black kids get the type of education we assure white children get. And it's not to say there are not white children who are poorly educated because God knows there are. But what it is to say is if there's black kids in that town, they're worse. That's racial caste that you can make that prediction and that probably there's no one in this room who's surprised by that, that the assumption is, of course, black kids will not have the same education as white kids. That is racial caste. That is what our segregated schools maintain and that is what integrated schools break up. So what are the natural outcomes of understanding that black and brown kids are placed into inferior schools? It is not surprising that we have a huge racial achievement gap in every city in the country it's not an achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap. Because the only way you believe it's an achievement gap is if you believe that black children are intellectually inferior and we know that they are not given the same opportunities to learn. We are at an institution of higher learning, so how does this separate but unequal system then play out? When it is time to apply for colleges, we all want to pretend that we have a meritocracy. Despite all of the facts on the ground, outline how black and brown children are receiving an inferior K-12 education when it comes time to apply for college. Lord knows if you have an affirmative action policy, people think that's unfair. 
because we want to pretend that we all have an equal shot of getting the same scores on our ACT, and we all went to the same types of high schools, we all had the same access to AP courses, when we know that that's not true. Affirmative action is about trying to right racial wrongs and trying to adjust for inequality. It is not about letting unqualified, undeserving students in over students who worked hard or not. Yet even with affirmative action, black and Latino kids are still vastly underrepresented at the top colleges in this country. So despite this belief that black kids are taking all everybody's seats, they're actually not. White people are doing quite well. The share of black freshmen at elite high school has actually remained unchanged since 1980. 40 years, we have seen no increase in the percentage of black kids at elite schools. And then if we look at Providence College, we see that black and Latino and Native American students are vastly underrepresented here. Now, I went to a Catholic university. I know how important at least uh, the idea of social justice is at Catholic universities, though my experience didn't necessarily bear that out. Um, I feel like this is an area that the college should be ashamed of, that a college located in a city like this should at least be able to match the demographics of the state, and that there's much more work to be done because you can't on the one hand acknowledge the grave inequality that black and Latino children face, and then somehow not acknowledge that when you're figuring out how to let people into your schools. Because when I talk about integration, I know we've become obsessed with test scores. And somehow we think the only thing that matters in a school is test scores. I can promise you, test scores, they measure some things, mostly what type of privilege you grew up in in your household, or how well you take a test or what type of knowledge uh, you've gained in certain areas of life. But test scores really aren't about anything. And when you go to college, really no one cares what you got on your like ninth grade tests. School segregation actually solidifies racial caste. And that is why integration matters. Yes, it's important to close achievement gaps. But achievement gaps are not the biggest problem with integration and segregation. What the longitudinal data shows is that integrated schools for black children actually changes the entire trajectories of their lives. That being able to attend an integrated quality school means that black people are able to break racial caste. What the data shows is those children are much more likely to graduate from college, they're less likely to go to jail, they're less likely to be poor, they're less likely to live in segregated neighborhoods. Now there are exceptional all black schools and there is nothing inherently wrong with an all black school. It's just that in this country, in a country based on racial apartheid, all black schools have never tended to get the same amount of resources. So we have a lot of reasons and excuses why we can't pursue integration. Politically, it's not possible. It's really hard to ride a bus. Except when the neighborhood is white and the schools are black, I see white parents putting their kids on buses all the time, as long as the buses are getting them away from their neighborhood schools. I live in New York City where parents will put their kids on the train for an hour to get them into the right school. So what we really have is a lack of will. What we really have is a fear of black children that we need to confront. Because if we say we believe in educational equality and there's only one reform that's ever worked on scale, it's not charter schools, it's not no child left behind, it's not race to the top, it's not vouchers. There's been one thing that's worked on scale, and that's school integration. Then we have to ask ourselves, why is that the one thing that's always off the table, no matter what? But that is the non-starter. Because the inequality is not accidental, which means we choose it. We make a choice. So we can either choose to sustain it or we can choose to undo it. One of the things that I've heard a lot in my work is I wrote about my own daughter. I did a piece about choosing a school for my daughter in New York City because I had written about school segregation for many years, most of the time without having a child of my own. And I can tell you, many of you 
don't have children, but one day maybe you will. It's much easier to have your values when you don't have to live them. I had a lot of values, and I think many of the people in this room had values until they were confronted with actually not having them as an abstraction, but having to make choices that lived up to those values. And so I covered school segregation, and I remember thinking about how hypocritical so many of the people who said they were advocates for justice were, because while they would say they were fighting for black kids and poor kids, when you'd ask them where they sent their kids to school, they weren't sending their kids to school with those kids that they said they were fighting for. They were fighting for those kids over there. And so I told myself way back when I was a young reporter that when the time came for me, I was not going to be like them. But I also didn't think I would end up in New York City, one of the most segregated, unequal school systems in the country. I live in a poor black neighborhood with poor black schools. I had managed to avoid school segregation myself. I was bused to white school starting in the second grade. My husband was a military brat. Uncle Sam doesn't play that, so he never attended a segregated school day in his life because base schools are integrated. And here I was having to decide what I was going to do with my child. And I decided, and then told my husband my decision, because that's basically how these things go, <laughs> that we were going to enroll our daughter in the school with kids like the kids that we have in our neighborhood, that we were not going to use our privilege to take her away from kids who are like our family members, that we could not say that segregation was wrong and then partake in a system that privileges white children and privileges middle class and upper middle class children. So I wrote about it because I understood that this decision is very hard. There's probably nothing that scares people more, you guys probably know with your own parents, than trying to ensure that your children will have the best possible chance in life. And I spent all these years writing about how segregation hurt black kids, and here I was deciding I was going to put my child in that school. But I also believe that if each of us says we believe in equality, but then makes decisions that uphold inequality, the system doesn't change. And one of the things that I heard from parents was how dare you sacrifice your child? How dare you put your child in a school like that? You don't have the right to experiment with her for some belief that you have. And so as I get ready to close out my speech, I want us all to think about the question that I asked back to every person who said that to me. It's whose children are worthy of the sacrifice? If we're going to continue to uphold schools, if we know that there are schools near us that we wouldn't dare send our children to, whose children deserve to be in those schools then? And it's not enough to say, oh, that's really, that's really sad for them. Because whether you believe it or not, then you are upholding that system. And every parent who decides not to uphold that system is working for justice. And every parent who makes a different decision, you can't claim that you're working for justice. Because there's a very easy mathematical calculation. And I am a journalist, so I'm not good at math. But you can't have equality while taking advantage for your own kids. It doesn't work that way. Equality means the opportunity that my child gets is the opportunity that your child gets. And maybe that means that my child doesn't go to a school with 24 advanced placement courses. Maybe my child goes to school with 12, so that the other school can have 12. It doesn't really seem like that much to give up. So I'm going to tell you about the young lady who was slide I showed you at the beginning of, the pic of, the, of my presentation. Because I think we always need to come back to understanding that all these abstractions are actually about real children and their lives in a country that says that education is the great equalizer. This young lady's name is Delisha. I met her uh, when I was writing about resegregation in the South. I fell in love with her the first time I met her because she has these huge dimples, and she always had a smile on her face. And she was the type of girl where if she wasn't a poor black girl with a name like Delisha with an apostrophe in her name, we would call her an all-American girl but we never ever called girls like her an All-American girl. Delisha was a state champion, track athlete. She was an honor student. She was class president. She was on the mayor's youth council. She did everything that we tell kids to do if they want to be successful. 
But Delisha was born into a town that had decided to resegregate its schools, and she attended from kindergarten through 12th grade, schools that were entirely black and where 90 plus percent of kids lived in poverty. The same types of schools that her grandfather had attended for 13 years when he was a child. It didn't matter to Delisha because it's the only types of schools that she ever knew. And she was a good student. So she didn't realize what she was not getting until she went to take her ACT prep class. And she took that class with white kids from across town at the integrated high school. And in all the months I'd been following her, that was the first time I saw her confidence shaken. She came back and she said, Miss Nicole, they knew so many things that I didn't know. But she was like, I'll just study and I'll be okay. Because you know, when it comes to poor black kids, all we talk about is resilience. We don't expect everybody else's kids to overcome every obstacle, but somehow this is what black kids are supposed to do to succeed. So she studied and she tried her best and she took her ACT. And the first time she took it, she got a 16. Now you college students know what that means if you wanna get into any decent college in this country. So she took it again and she got the same score. And she would come home every day while most kids your age and her age who had done all of the things that she did would come home and their mailboxes would be brimming with letters from colleges who were courting them. She would come and if she was lucky there would be a recruitment letter from the Army or the Navy because that's the expectation for kids who are poor and black going to poor black high schools who get a 16 on ACT. So she took it a third time and she got another 16. And at that point I said, are you going to take it again? And she was like, no, Miss Nicole, why would I take it again? I'm never going to be able to learn enough to get a high enough score. So at 17 years old is when she realized that she had not been educated. She had dreamed of going to the University of Alabama. So those stadium lights back there are in the famous Tuscaloosa uh, Stadium, the Crimson Tide. Her school was a few blocks from that program. All the professors live around her school, but their kids are bused to the integrated public high school and away from the school that's in their neighborhood. And she had dreamed that she would go to that school because, well, y'all might know this, but they're kind of crazy about University of Alabama and Tuscaloosa. And she had told me how she imagined that this would be the first time she would ever sit in an integrated classroom. That she was looking forward to studying Shakespeare with kids who were Latino and Asian, and not just going to school with kids all the time who were just like her. That she wanted to have discussions, that she wanted to be able to see the world from a different perspective. But you can't get into the University of Alabama with a 16. It doesn't matter what your grade point is. And the University of Alabama also knows that her high school is a low-performing high school. Because while the white high school had approximately 15 advanced placement courses, her high school had none. Her high school didn't offer physics. It didn't have a newspaper or a yearbook or any of the things that we expect out of our high school. So we told her what she needed to do to succeed. But we didn't live up to our end of the deal. And Alicia didn't give up. She's not the type of girl to give up. She ended up getting into Miles College, which is a historically black college in Birmingham. She's graduating this May. She was determined. And I support historically black colleges. I feel like they are important and they play a critical role, but that was not what she wanted. And if it's not what she wanted, then it's more than she deserved. So when we ask the question, whose children are worthy of the sacrifice, we already know the answer because the same children we've always sacrificed in this country. And now we have a crop of other students because during the time of Brown, the Latino population in this country was quite small. But as we've seen that population rise, we've seen that they are also being treated in much the way that black Americans have been treated and they are also being segregated away from opportunity. So if we think about Martin Luther King, we wrap this up about why we're even here today. 
I know our favorite thing about Martin Luther King is I have a dream. One, most of us have never read that whole speech either because I have a dream is a very small part of that speech. He actually talks about uh, the check that was returned on America marked insufficient funds because of the promises that America had broken to black people. But we somehow, that's not a great sound bite for our McDonald's commercials. And Dr. King did not die in 1963. He lived for five more years. And his speeches became increasingly more radical over those five years. This is a quote from a speech where he asked, where do we go from here, chaos or community? This speech was given a few months before he was assassinated. At this point in time, he had lost a great deal of his white support. White support had gone down about 25 percentage points in four years. The majority of white Americans were at that point opposed to him. And then, of course, one white American killed him. So what he says is there's never been a commitment on the majority of white Americans for genuine equality for Negroes. This is not the king that you get in your uh, history class. He says there's always been ambivalence. And when we talk about where do we go from here, we have to honestly face that in order for us to address this inequality, it calls for a fundamental restructuring of our whole society. But there are no easy fixes. There are no ways to fix these problems without giving up any of the unearned advantage that you may have had in a country built on racial caste. The whole structure must change. And then he says there's no time for romantic illusions and empty philosophical debates about freedom. Because we all come to these convocations because we like to imagine, had we been alive back then, some of us were alive back then, but I won't call y'all out. We like to imagine we would have been on the right side of things. And it's very easy, 50 years removed, to say we would have been on the right side of things. To say we would have marched with King and we would have supported and how appalling it was that they fought what he was trying to do. But then we have to look at what side are you on right now? Because the side you're on right now is the side you would have been on back then. If you're not working, to fundamentally restructure our unequal society, if you're simply coasting along and accepting the benefits, if you fight any efforts to integrate schools, to bring about more equality, for whatever reasons you tell yourselves, you would have done that back then too. And you don't really get to claim his legacy. Because his legacy one was a radical change of saying we are, are we finally going to treat all Americans as full citizens. Because it's not enough to hope for a better day. I don't know who I stole this from. So don't try to say I plagiarized it. I'm giving credit, I just don't know to whom. <laughs> hope is an action. I'm not you know, a religious person, but I know the Bible says faith without works is dead. So to simply say I have hope that one day the world will be better without taking any action to make it so. And there's a very simple action you can make if you have children, if you one day will have children, is to put your children in the schools with the kids that other people don't want to put their children in schools with. Then accept that you actually don't want equality if you can't do those things. Because my daughter has not been harmed a bit by being in a classroom with other kids who happen to be black and happen to be poor. And trust me when I say, my daughter has benefited as much from being in that school as I would ever hope those kids would benefit from her having her in the classroom. Because she's learned. Having things doesn't make you smart. Having things doesn't make you a good person. You can be poor and have just as much to offer clearly as anyone else. And these things seem like they make sense and that they're clear, but they're not. Because we uphold segregation because we fear our children. And we fear for our children. And so we decide that we will uphold the system. So go home tonight, look in your mirror, and ask yourself really what side are you on? 
Do you believe all of our children deserve equality or not? You deserve, do, do you believe your children deserve more than other children or not? And if you do, own it. Don't come hear me speak anymore though. Hope is an action. Take an action. In a small community like this, change can be very easy and transformative. Leave here and try to be better than you were today. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me uh, just say, right now, um, we have microphones on the sides. And I invite you, if you have questions, to come forward and ask. You can, I think you can see now why uh, these articles that she wrote were uh, provoked such lively discussion in our classes. So if anyone has any questions, in the Humanities Forum, we like to hear questions from the students first. So I invite anyone with a question. Always hard to get that first one. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanya. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for, for your talk. Um, I, on one of the slides you showed, I think it was the one comparing um, the different races and uh, I think it was the third grade test scores. On one of those slides, there, there were stark disparities, but then when it got to high school graduation rates, they looked similar, and I was wondering what kind of interventions are happening between those third grade scores and high school that account for that, that change. That I don't think that there are interventions. They're measuring two very different things, right? So one is measuring test scores. Um, if that slide had looked at uh, assessment scores for high school, that gap would still be there. Um, but measuring high school completion is a different thing. You can complete high school with a 60% grade point average, right? Um, so there is one, there is still a, a gap in graduation rates, but they're just not measuring the same things. And what you also tend to find um, is black and brown kids are just attending inferior high schools. So graduating from a high school like that uh, means you're graduating having received a very different education, uh, the kids who are graduating from a more resourced high school. Let me just say, I, I rarely see, inter there aren't usually great interventions that are happening. You usually are seeing that gap tending to widen if you're looking just at test scores. So on one of the slides, I think said that 22% of black students were in for-profit colleges. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of probes my initial question would be, um, you have the rise of charter schools and privatized education in anywhere from pre-K to high school now. And I was wondering if, in any of your work, if you sort of investigated um, what threat that poses, not um, to the ongoing problems of segregation in schools and achievement gaps, as well as to public education as a whole, and um, if that privatized education, in a way, has helped facilitate, for example, since 1988. Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, I always get a charter school question which I largely try to avoid talking about charter schools, but I always get a charter school question. Uh, what the data shows, one, is charter schools exacerbate school segregation. Um, I, in general, don't believe in privatization of public goods. That's just my personal stance. I believe that uh, public schools should be for the public, which means they should be run by the public and accountable to the public. Uh, what we know is privatization takes resources away from the masses of students. Um, it leads to lower amounts of money for schools to provide services for all of their students. They don't, charters don't have to abide by the same rules. Um, traditional public schools have to serve every student no matter what. Charter schools do not have to. So in general, I believe, and liberals and conservatives, their responsibility for the way that we have introduced market terminology into public schools, uh, the way that we talk about them as if they are a business, we assume they should be run like a business. Uh, the motivation of business is profit. 
the motivation of common good is a common good, right? It is, it is for us to look out for each other and to benefit the entirety of society. So I think uh, our effort to provide school choice and to make it seem like everyone should be able to shop for quality schools um, instead of ensuring that all schools are quality, it just turns into a self-perpetuating cycle because the more that uh, public schools are defunded by privatization, the worse off those schools become. And then you can make the argument whether well, schools are shitty, so we deserve more privatization. Um, I think originally when you look at charter schools, the idea of them was very good. They were to be locally controlled schools. They were to give um, people a chance to have less bureaucracy, to have more say. But now venture capitalists are making money off of uh, segregated kids and poor kids and black kids and not necessarily providing a better education. So um, in general, it's not something that I don't have any bias on, but also uh, the data on it is pretty clear. There are some exceptional charter schools that do very well. It's not scalable to the masses. Um, and there are exceptional traditional public schools that do very well, so. Oh, if I could quickly just address the other part of your question, which was about for-profit schools. Uh, I didn't really talk about this in my speech, but the reason that that's problematic, which you guys can probably imagine, is it sets up a two-tiered um, educational system once you get out of college. Black people are disproportionately going into those schools because those schools tend to be more predatory. Um, the Obama administration was trying to regulate those schools. Kids are getting large amounts of student loan debt and not graduating or graduating with diplomas that are not really worth it. Uh, for instance, Michael Brown, whom I um, discussed his school system in my This American Life piece, do you remember the narrative about him was that he was going to college. He was actually going to one of those uh, predatory for-profit schools that the Obama administration has sanctioned, which meant he wasn't really going to what we consider college. So it sets up a system where uh, Black folks are going into schools where they're unlikely to have degrees that are going to serve them, allow them to make money, and they have a huge amount of debt. Meanwhile, um, white people are much more likely to go to institutions like this. Uh, thank you for your speech as well. Um, so I think something that I've heard of white neighborhoods is their property value being affected by um, the schools that their children are being brought to. So I'm wondering if you kind of see that as just like a scapegoat of uh, what they want to have their reasoning for uh, like where they're living be, um, as well as if there's anything to combat this um, kind of reason to live in those types of neighborhoods. Yeah, that's a great question. So reality is perception. So there's two things. Property values are affected by schools, but that's because the people who determine property values are Americans who also buy into racial ideology, right? So if you think about um, how we determine property values, we had a system until 1968 where uh, actually created by the federal government under the um, Fair Housing Administration that said that housing in black neighborhoods was too risky you couldn't uh, insure loans in those neighborhoods, and it artificially propped up housing values in white neighborhoods. So when white people would say black people moving into the neighborhood lowers the property values, it actually literally did. But not because black people weren't keeping up their property, but because the federal government determined that integrated, racially mixed, or black neighborhoods were too risky and not worth lending in. So then it becomes a perception that it is black people who are ruining your property values when really it's racist policy. When the 68 Civil Rights Act gets passed outlawing racial discrimination in housing, we didn't do a readjustment of property values that said, okay, let's adjust all of these racist property values and make it even. We just kept going. And so to this day, uh, there's been lawsuits about this. You can see the exact same house in a white neighborhood versus a black neighborhood, and the house in the white neighborhood will be worth significantly more. And we all know, if you've ever been in any gentrifying community, as soon as white people start moving into a neighborhood, housing values go up, even though nothing is fundamentally changed. So because of that, there is a reality that schools do affect property values. And when you look at real estate agents, though I would say it's quasi-illegal, they're marketing about the school system. 
right? And they're marketing really about the demographics of the school system. So then the perception becomes that I have to keep these people out because it's going to lower my property values. And in some ways they might be right, but again, not for the reasons. Uh, because it's actually common sense. If you can afford to live in the neighborhood, you can afford to live in the neighborhood. So it's not about your income or you couldn't live there. And the truth is, uh, because of racial discrimination, often black people who are moving into these neighborhoods have to earn more. They have to have better credit or else they can't even get into the neighborhoods. What can you do about that? It's very easy and also the hardest thing in the world. You have to um, stop funding school systems by local property tax. We are one of the only countries in the world that does this. Um, and you have to consolidate school districts. So one of the reasons school desegregation was so successful in the South was most school districts in the South are countywide, which means they include the city, the suburbs, and rural areas all in one school district. You couldn't simply move you know, five miles up the road and avoid desegregation and move into an all-white school district because no matter where you lived in the county, you all attended the same school district. In the North, as you know, you can have 30 school districts in one county. Each one has its own attendance zone, sets its own policy, has its own taxing system. You need to consolidate those. That takes away a lot of those property issues and those taxing issues. That's the easy thing to do. It is also the thing that is going to be nearly impossible to do and the only ways uh, wealthy white communities are never going to voluntarily vote to give that up. Matter of fact, what do you hear people say? I moved here to get access to these types of schools and if I wanted to share my schools with them, I wouldn't live here. So the only way that you can really do that is by uh, court order or if the governor decides to consolidate school districts on its own. This is something that folks can advocate for, but what I find is uh, when I bring this up to white liberals who are looking for solutions, all of a sudden their eyes start glazing over and they're like, hell no, so I don't know. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to say first thank you for your speech. It was very enlightening. Um, and I was extremely impacted by what you were saying about the girl that wanted to go to the University of Alabama but wasn't able to. And I was just kind of curious if you were worried that your own daughter like might fall into that same situation mm. because, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, yes and no. So in the piece that I wrote about my daughter, I did talk about how Oh, Lord, see? Told you, man. The man is listening. Uh, how I, I do have worries, and I'm not confident every single day that I made the right decision. Um, and she's young, and pretty soon it's going to be time for middle school. And as we know, the older you get, the stakes get higher and higher. But I also know that this is the, the privilege that I have. Anything my daughter doesn't get in the school, I can get her. I can hire tutors like people do for their kids all the time. You know, when you look at uh, these high test scores, it's often very seldom just because the kid was just smart. It's because parents were ensuring if you didn't do well on that test, they hire somebody to make sure you do well on the test next time. I can provide her everything um, that she would need to compete. So I think one of the things that I try to get through to more advantaged parents is the stakes are actually not really that high for us. Who the stakes are high for are my daughter's classmates who live in the housing project across the street and whose parents work at you know, uh, Popeyes or work for NYCHA and where the only thing advantage they might be able to give their kid is a quality public education. And we wanna take that too. We don't even wanna share that. So no, I don't, I should say, I, I, I should make this explicit. Like my dream for my daughter is not to go to Harvard or I don't care about any of that. I, I want her, of course, to go to college. I want her to be successful. But I think this idea that to be a good parent, you have to vie for every damn advantage in the world for your child is ridiculous. It, it's not that important. I just want her to go to Howard. I want to be her roommate. And she told me, she literally, she's eight, and she told me the other day, mom, it's not going to happen. I was like, damn. Um, <laughs> Because like, you know, most parents, I try to live vicariously through my daughter and I wish I had gone to Howard and I didn't. Um, but I think we just need to calm down and, and, and really think about what's more important to me 
Is my daughter a good person? That she's empathetic? That she treats people with humanity? That she understands the world that she's in? That she understands she's not the most important thing in the world? My daughter is smart, but she's average smart, right? Like, I don't need to believe my child is brilliant and deserving of every advantage and the best of everything. I think she deserves a good quality public education. I think she deserves to have the same things that other kids have. And I don't actually spend a lot of time worrying that she won't get into Yale because I don't want her to go there anyway. And, <laughs> and if she really wants to, maybe she'll get in and maybe she won't. But I, I really think we need to get a grip. Um, and I'm not saying you don't have a grip. But I, I, is, it, is it worth it to me that my child will have everything if that means other kids have almost nothing? And the answer is it's not. It's not worth it to me. And maybe one day my, mom, my daughter will come to me and say, Mom, what the hell were you thinking? She might. She might regret the decisions that I made. Um, I asked my mom that though, and she got me bus to white schools. And I asked her, what were you thinking? Like, do you know what that was like for me? But she made the best decision that she could, and I'm gonna make the best decision that I can. And I talked to my daughter enough about why we do the things that we do that I think she'll understand. And I know either way, uh, she'll be fine, and all you guys' kids will be fine. That's the thing, because you can make up for anything that they don't have. See, I told you all my answers are like mad long, sorry. Hello, so uh, my name is Reed Thompson. It was a great speech, as everyone else has said. Thank you. You have to press the button while I talk. All right, All right so my name is there Reed Thompson, and thank you so much for your speech. It was a great time. And I was just wondering what you had to think about schools that were white but also underprivileged, because there were a lot of, um, like there were a couple of school districts that were near where I'm from in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that were pretty similar to what you were talking about, but instead of being all minorities, they were still primarily white people? Yeah, so as I said in the speech, of course there are disadvantaged white schools. And when I advocate uh, for black children, it's not at the expense of other children. I believe that all of our children are deserving of a quality, well-funded public education. What I will say, though, is that there is a distinct difference between you're attending a poor public school because you happen to live in a poor community or you're attending a poor public school because you're black and we live in a fundamentally racist society that is ensuring that this is the type of education that you're going to receive. So it's not to say that white kids don't struggle, but they don't struggle because they're black. And the truth is, if you look at the data, uh, most black kids attend a, ma a majority impoverished school. Most black kids are not poor. So what that tells you is that there is a distinct racial advantage that black people experience that has nothing to do with class. And the typical middle class black child is in a high poverty school and is in a poor neighborhood than the typical poor white child. And on average, poor white children, according to the US Census, live in middle class white neighborhoods and poor white children actually live in more advantaged neighborhoods than middle class black children. So of course I, uh, I care about white children who are not receiving a quality education. But most people, you didn't bring up Appalachia, so I appreciate that because people always bring up Appalachia. And I'm like, if you can only bring up one place where this is true for white kids, you've just made my point. Because I can show you any community in the country, rural, suburban, or urban, where black kids are, and this is the education that they receive. But of course, uh, I think when you look at the teacher strikes in Oklahoma, right, these are a lot of white kids who are going to schools that we've pretty much accepted black kids go to, but we get shocked when like white kids are in those types of schools. And I supported those teacher strikes because I believe no matter what, the promise that we can offer to American kids is that it doesn't matter what your poverty is, you should be able to go to school and get a quality education. And I think that we are fundamentally failing a lot of kids, no matter their color, but we're particularly failing black kids. You're welcome. I want to say thank you um, for a real courageous uh, speech. You look like one of my relatives. Yeah, <laughs> long lost <laughs> we might be. Um, my name is Carlene. I'm a staff member here. 
And um, I just have a question about your daughter. Um, I grew up in a minority community about 15 minutes from here. Um, we're predominantly brown and black. And I had the privilege to go on to a higher ed, another a Jes Jesuit school, we won't name it, in DC. Ah, um, okay. And I had the privilege of getting my master's degree, but a lot of my peers did not. Um, and when I decided to purchase my home last year, I decided to move back to my community um, and purchase a home there. And as an expected mom, I will send my daughter to the schools I attended as well. Um, and I understand that's an active decision, just yes. like yourself. Um, and I have two questions dealing with that. How do how can I talk to my peers who decide to move out of those communities for advantages and better resources to stay? And two, in Rhode Island, we are very segregated um, by communities. It's very easy, five minutes, 10 minutes. You're in a completely different neighborhood with different demographics. Um, how do, how does somebody in, um, you know, a white community who may be a liberal but, you know, still s sends their students to that school, um, what kind of advice could you give them to um, kind of integrate and be a part of the community better, even though they have to send their, their child to that school? Um, what other, how, how else can they advocate for other students? Great. Um, so one thing I, I feel like I should make clear, I don't believe the obligation to integrate schools is on black people. Black people did not create the system of inequality. Uh, many of us are the first generation who even had an opportunity to get a quality education ourselves. Uh, when you look at the data, the stakes for us are very, very high. We have uh, the lowest rates of social mobility of all races. We are uh, actually more likely for our children to fall out of the middle class um, than to stay in it. So I think that uh, it is unfair to say that after two and a half centuries, when finally there are some black folks who are getting a quality education and working their way into the middle class, that we should have to give up that one bit of advantage we might be able to offer to our children. Um, with that said, I also realize um, other people are not saving our kids. So while it's not our obligation, kind of is. So I have to say I, I applaud and respect that you move back to your neighborhood. Uh, as you know, we're always taught that success means you leave your neighborhood, you get out, and I believe that success means you go back and rebuild and help others in your community uh, live to be able to be successful. I have uh, always choose to live in poor black communities on purpose. This is an active choice. I don't have to financially, but I choose to. So I applaud that decision. Uh, what I find uh, when trying to convince other black parents, and really I, I don't feel like I have a right to tell black parents what to do, but I do try to guilt everybody, whether they're black or white. Uh, <laughs> is I think when I speak to black parents, I speak about our obligation to our own children. And I speak about the fact that we have been waiting 250 years for white people to do right by our kids and they never have, so it's gonna be on us. Um, but that does not in any way let white people off the hook for, um, because the risks are just so much lower for white Americans uh, than they are for black people. The second part of your question, I think that if you're asking what white folks who live in white areas can do, one, let's recognize that living in a white area is a choice. And I can't tell you how many times I hear people who are like, white folks who are like, I just somehow ended up in this all white place and I realized there's no diversity in my kids' schools. I don't buy it, right? Like you, you clearly, saw the place where you move, you made a choice. So I don't know that people in those communities are necessarily really looking. I think it becomes a convenient excuse to say, I would love diversity, there just doesn't so happen to be any around. So I think when you have to actively choose not to live in that type of community, uh, you have to support affordable housing measures in your community. So if you're in a community like that and someone wants to build an affordable housing apartment complex, are you fighting that or are you supporting that? Um, strong and fair, 
enforcement of the Fair Housing Act means that those white communities become more integrated? Do you allow Section 8 housing in your communities? All of these things are types of things that can integrate housing. And what we also know is most of these black schools are under-enrolled, and you don't have to live in a neighborhood to go. So most parents, if they really wanted to put their kids in those schools, even if they don't live in the neighborhood, they could. So I, uh, you know, if you sat through this long ass speech I gave, then you know I'm not here to like make people feel good. I'm just here to tell it like it is, and I think people make a choice. And luckily I haven't gotten a question yet today, but I always get the question like, what should I do? And I'm always like, did you listen to my whole speech? <laughs> um, if you don't want this inequality, you have to make a choice to produce something different. And that choice has to start with your own children. That's basically it. So again, I, I commend you for your decision. Um, the last thing I would quickly add to that is you become an example. When you make the decision, he's stepping up to my, <laughs> he's like, you need to stop talking. Um, have a reception, so okay. Make, when you make the right decision, when you actually do it, it becomes harder for other people who say that they could never do it. And what I have found is, since I wrote the story about my own daughter and was very honest, right? I was honest about having arguments with my husband. When we were having those arguments, he clearly didn't think those arguments were going to be in the New York Times. Um, I was honest about my own fears. I was honest about his fears. I was honest about the risks. And I think saying that I've assessed all of this and I still made this choice, then it's much harder for other parents to say, it's impossible for me to do this because you are showing that it's possible. And people always ask me, is your daughter still in that school? And I feel like they're halfway hoping that I say no. Because then they can say, see, even you couldn't do it. So just by virtue of you making that choice, when you're talking to your friends, that is convincing in and of itself. And I say that to any parent who makes that choice. Hi. Um, I was wondering, in regards to like black students going to a majority white school, if you thought that um, teachers' biases then play a role in those black students' education still. That's a rhetorical question. Just playing. Uh, clearly. So <laughs> the sad truth is, if you are black in this country, there will be a struggle. It's which one? Uh, for my daughter, being in a mostly black learning environment has been beautiful. It's everything that I didn't get because I was one of a handful of white kids bust into a white neighborhood with all white teachers and every day we had to get on the bus and leave their neighborhood and it was very clear that this wasn't our school and we didn't belong. I also got a quality education and it's probably the reason why I'm standing before you all today and why anybody even knows who I am. So. There's no, unfortunately, perfect situation for black parents. You're going to have to give up something. There's a few places that are semi-utopian in terms of integration, in terms of integrated faculty and integrated schools, but they are very rare and they're almost always in the South, almost never up here. Um, so I think the risk assessment is different depending on who you are. As a middle class black parent, putting my child in a black school and having that cultural affirmation, but understanding that I can academically make up for anything she may be lacking means that I'm, the risk for my child being in that school is much lower. Um, for a poor black mother who cannot pay for outside tutoring, who cannot provide all of these other things, who doesn't have clout, like trust. When, when you're a New York Times reporter in a school, certain shit just doesn't happen, right? So. Things that other black parents had complained about, when they told me and I complained about it, it got fixed immediately. So it's those types of things where the dynamics change. So for them, the cultural aspects are less important than actually making sure that their kids get an education. Um, so yeah, we're going, we're going to give something up. Almost every school desegregation case started with black parents simply demanding an equal education for their kids. Most black parents who filed desegregation lawsuits were not actually seeking integration. They were demanding quality education um, and often did not want their kids bused to white schools and they didn't want their kids to not have black teachers. But as W.E.B. Du Bois said, because it is the system that is racist, it's not a problem with integrated schools, it's because we implement integrated schools in a racist way. 
And so integration is good for everyone, but it has to be done in a way that is equitable, where the schools reflect the culture of the kids, where the teachers reflect the culture of the kids, and actually the research shows all kids benefit from black teachers, and that white kids actually prefer black teachers when they have one. And I think with that, they want me to exit. But uh, again, thank you all for, for all of your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you again. That was a great, uh, great talk. I hope you all will join us as the Humanities Forum does. We have a reception immediately after the talk, so come ask questions, talk about this very thought-provoking talk. We'll be meeting across the hall in the, um, uh, the fishbowl for the reception, so please everyone join us. Thank you again. <laughs>